W-O-V-U-L-P, Cleveland. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture, find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Grand Rising, welcome to another edition of Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson and my guest this morning is a Cleveland native. His name is Michael he has a nickname it's honeycomb last name hennigan and i have known him for quite some time and i have to tell you i'm i'm extremely pleased to have this conversation with him finally so welcome to open door michael thank you thank you for having me okay so uh i mentioned your moniker why don't we start with that how did you become known as honeycomb okay well I I started playing harmonica just before I, I, well, I picked up the harmonica. I never could say I was playing it just before I left and went to California. And when I came back, uh, I started uh, playing harmonica again. I had to go through some changes, you know, I had to get my life back on track. But uh, I was trying to come up with a hook name because I noticed that all the harmonica players had their little hook name. You had a James Cotton, you had a, a Sonny Boy, and you had a, well, all, all, the, all the cool harmonica players had their hook name. So I'm trying to think of one. I'm thinking like Hurricane or Godzilla or or something like that. And I just happened to have one of my harmonica cases open. And at the time, I was tur- I was stacking my harmonicas in there with the cone facing up. And I said, "Man, that looks like the inside of a beehive. That looks like a honeycomb." And that's where I got it. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad to know that. So we're going to rewind and talk about your life before you came became acquainted with the uh, with the harmonicas and were inspired to name yourself Honeycomb. Uh, we started off saying that you are from Cleveland. So uh, represent your hood and tell us what it was like to grow up in Cleveland. Well, it was entirely different. Uh, I, I grew up on 93rd between Superior and Way Park, right off of Ansel. And at that time, it was like a middle-class neighborhood. Uh, we had all types of professional people on it. We even still had some white people on the street as I was growing up. Uh, now, Superior was like a borderline and then you had Huff was another borderline because we still had a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Jewish owned stores and stuff in the neighborhood. So if you crossed over Superior you ran into all those Europeans, the Slovaks, the Polacks and all that kind of stuff and uh we weren't allowed over there. And then when you came across uh, Way Park, all those big apartment buildings and stuff, that was all, all Jewish property and stuff like that, you know. Had Jewish stores. We had some businesses in the neighborhood. At one time, there was a, a eyeglass manufacturer. We had a drug store on Way Park right there at uh, was that uh, 93rd and Way Park, you know, and so it, it was kind of a multicultural, diverse neighborhood, you know, and uh, I sort of had no perspective of what being black was, you know, because we had the black and white TV. I grew up looking, listening to... Uh, 
I dream of Beaver or My Three Sons and, you know, all those those television programs, you know. So uh, we didn't talk about the black diaspora at that time. You know, we just knew we were different, you know, because of, we stood out in the crowd. But uh, I graduated from East Tech High School. And I was in the marching band there. You know, I was never really good because uh, I was playing a B-flat cornet at the time. And when I would bring it home and try to practice, my dad told me, look, if you want to play that thing, you're going to take it to the park. So quiet as kept, I never got really good at it. And uh, so I went off to the Navy in uh, 68, right after I graduated. Uh, I came out of high school, worked for the Phyllis Wheatley uh, Camp Mueller, and went from there to the Navy boot camp, Great Lakes. So I did my little stint in the Navy. I came back home in 70. Uh, Still wanted to play, you know, so I went and bought me one of them little $100 bases and a little $100 amp. It was okay. Went to California, rode a Greyhound bus, and uh, went out there and played some rock and roll because that's what I was into at the time and uh, ended up on the wrong train. Uh, I ended up on that hellbound train. So when I came back from California, I was playing harmonica. And uh, I sort of like, you know, had it all put to the side because uh, I had to get rid of the bad habits that I had picked up while I was in California. So I came here. I came back home in 90. I left here in 74. I came back in 90. Uh I fooled around in the city for a year, and then finally I sat down on the porch with my dad and said, look, I want to get my my act together, so would you go up to the VA with me? So make a long story short, I got in a rehab program at the VA hospital, and then I stayed in the domiciliary for a year, you know, to figure out, you know, why I was doing what I was doing. So when I came to grip with all of that, I started playing again. You know, I had me a little hollow body bass, and uh, I bought a few harmonicas. So I started going to jam sessions and stuff like that. And I was that's when I really started learning about harmonica, how to play it, and so forth and so on, and where it fit in with the band. And at that time... I had to figure out how to become a lead person, you know, a front man, because nobody really needed a harmonica player. And that's basically where I really started this journey. You know, I played in California, you know, harmonica and played bass. I had bought a flute at the time, you know, so I would do a little bit of that. But my flute playing was basically just me playing me under bridges and parking lot and parking garages and any place that had cool acoustics. But I started sitting in at these jam sessions playing harmonica, and uh, I remember going out to one of the bad boys of blues. Michael Bay's jam session. He was doing a guitar center jam session out at this club out in Jester. So I would drive out there and, you know, he sort of gave me some suggestions on what harmonicas I needed to have, you know. So when the band started playing, I would have a harp that worked with it, you know. I can't help but flash back to... uh the transition that occurred as you were growing up, you said that you left Cleveland in 1968, which was really a pivotal year 
in the yeah. history, history of black folk in, in not only Cleveland, but across the country. But you described yeah. um, living in a multicultural neighborhood, but at the same time seemed as though that there were walls up. It seems as though even though there were people present, there wasn't a lot of intermingling uh, going on. And I'm curious about uh, what you perceived as the transition, the tipping point. You know, there was a point when white folks started leaving these these black communities in Cleveland. What do you remember about that? Okay. Uh, in the in the 60s, in, in, no, it started in the late 50s, early 60s. We started seeing uh, all the uh, business people, the doctors, the lawyers. You know, that's when the the government and these these uh, I call them biddies. You know, they would come and they started talking about well. You don't need to live down here. You know, you can come out. You can. You're a professional. You can come out and live out in the Heights and all this your kind of stuff. You know, this is when they started running that psych job, job on us, trying to break up our 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 neighborhoods and our villages. And I, I may not be pro- pronouncing the guy's name correctly, Doctor Omar Omar, the uh, black psychologist, or whatever. It is. Omar Johnson. Yeah, mm-hmm. he he has a, has a video on Facebook that really hits the turning points on on the on the nail. You know, he's right on top of things because in the '60s they started all these social programs trying to break up the black uh, family. Uh, this is when you had the birth of the single the uh, single mother family and uh, the drug culture really started hitting our neighborhood because of uh, you, well the government influence on trying to tear up our social fabric because we were moving too fast. We were working in these uh, factories and stuff like that, skilled labor and stuff like that, and we were moving up. We started sending our kids to college and all this other kind of stuff, and uh, it got to the point where those people, I'm not, I'm not going to use any racial disparities, but I'll just say those people, and you'll know who I'm talking about, Started saying, "Hey, we gotta slow this stuff up. They making too much money. They 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 moving up. They they buying up our, these houses. They want to move in our neighborhoods and all this because they first started pulling out, you know, the doctors and lawyers, but they didn't put no control valve on it. So it got to the point where if you had the money." You can live out there. Okay. So So. I I, want to get back to this when we come back from the other side of these uh, PSAs. We're going to continue our conversation about the tipping point and the changes that you observed. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Michael Honeycomb Hennigan. We'll be right back after this. Hi, this is Wanda Harris from Warrensville Heights, Ohio, and you're listening to the best radio station in Cleveland, WOVU 95.9 FM, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We're back on Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest this morning is Michael Honeycomb Hennigan, and he was describing uh, just a few moments ago how he noticed the complexion of his neighborhood changing uh, you were talking about how it seemed as though you were saying some of us professionals were, you know, getting paid, getting money, and uh, were also leaving the neighborhoods. Was that what you observed as well? Yeah. Uh, it was a village when I was growing up. My neighbor would discipline me and 
tell my parents what I was doing wrong that was, you know, outside of the uh, set rules for the neighborhood, and then my father would discipline me also. You know, it it, it was no, it was none of that. Well, you can't, you can't, you can't discipline my child. Or you can't tell my child what to do. It was we all looked out for each other, and we all had each other's best interests at hand. And unlike today, where you know you got to constantly watch your back, even around your own people. But. Uh, I graduated, like I said, I graduated from me second, 68. And I went through their electronics and electricity program. Let me give you some background. I first went out to East High. And uh, East High was a college prep school. I knew I was going to college. So on my second year at East High, uh, I came and told my dad I wanted to transfer and go to a technical school. So long story short, I ended up at East Tech. I had to start all over as a freshman because I had to start at the beginning of the course. So I graduated from their electronics and electricity program. And uh, at that time, you couldn't get into electronics in Cleveland if you were black. It was it was a good old boy club. Now you could be an electrician, an electrician's helper, work in the steel mills and dig out slag pits and stuff like that, which were all good paying jobs, but I was I had my mind set on becoming something. So uh even then there was barriers. Because Cleveland has always been an old money, good old boys club. Uh, it, it it was interesting, you know. Uh, when I came back from the Navy and I'd go to apply for jobs, you know, uh, I'd do really good on the interview. And when I called for or to get an interview to get my foot in the door, you know, uh, we'd have these telephone conversations, and when you got when you you learned to look, because I had fairly good diction, I knew how to speak fairly properly. You know, people used to say I talked like a white boy when I was coming up, but I just spoke fairly proper, and uh, you could always tell when there was that double take because. I had that weird last name of Hennigan because when I grew up in, in in my younger days, everybody was a Smith, a Brown, Johnson. a White, you know. Johnson. But uh, Hennigan, well, that was way outside of the box for the norm, you know. So you go to your interview and you, you walk in and – you say, hi, my name is Michael Hennigan. I'm here for my interview for such and such and so forth. They look at you, and then they look at the resume, and then they look at you again. Next thing you know, they was on the phone talking to somebody, and, you know, they were talking in low tones. <laughs> you know, so a lot of jobs I didn't get. I didn't, wasn't even considered for, so I got tired of being turned down. So I, I packed up everything I had and hopped on the Greyhound bus. Mm. So you uh, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. When I got to California, it was different. I hopped into community college and uh, tried to get jobs in the electronics. And if you could do the job, you got the job. It wasn't, you know, no, we're not, we're not, we're not hiring black people in this profession, you know. So I got an electronics. So I got really good. I moved up pretty quick. Uh, I did some time overseas as a field service uh, test engineer when I was working for one of these uh, electronic companies and. Blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to go into all the details, but in the meantime, 
I ended up on the wrong train, and you know, on that hellbong train, and you know. So I was working for a Persian guy out there. I was full blown crackhead at the time, but I still had my mind, you know, my head on my shoulders pretty tight. And uh, I learned how to build computers. I learned how to test computers. I learned how to troubleshoot computers. You know, I basically ran his business for him. So he even sent me to uh, Sharp Facsimile School when the facsimile started came out and became popular. He would charge his clients $150 an hour for me to come out and work on their equipment and was paying me $5 an hour. Mm. So I got tired. I called home. You know, my brother sent me a ticket. I came back to Cleveland. Okay. Uh, 91, I was in the VA Medical Center domiciliary out at Brexville before it closed. And I got hired at the VA uh, from them, from there, from my resume. In fact, while I was a, uh inmate uh, in the domiciliary, I was working for the VA and their, this little program that they had but I was fixing computers instead of, you know, working in housekeeping and, you know, pushing patients around. I was going around troubleshooting computers, fixing computers, and so forth. I ended up retiring from the VA hospital as a lead information technology uh, specialist. But in the meantime, in between time, I went back to the harmonica and started playing. So I started playing around. I got barely noticed, you know, but I had to learn how to become a front man. I had to learn how to run a band and so forth just to get on stage and just to, uh, you know, just to play. So I picked up another craft, and I'm basically where I'm at right now. I'm working. I've had a few bands of my own. I used to have a band called uh, Honeycomb and the Mercenaries because everybody was a mercenary, excuse me. Uh, they didn't want to rehearse because Cleveland was full of all these superstars and these people who have such big egos, uh, but they would show up for the gig. So I couldn't really do what I wanted to do because that required rehearsing. So I just started doing blues standards and a, and a few other things. Every now and then I would throw something original in there, you know. In fact, I got branded, you know, for a guy who did monologues, and they didn't like doing monologues, you know, because uh, some of them were too windy and stuff, but uh, I like monologues. You get to tell a story, and basically that's how I look at the blues now. Playing yesterday's blues was good yesterday, but now I'm I'm launching uh, this project where I'm going to start doing today's blues, talking about all the stuff that we're facing as a people, as a society, as a country, you know. And now, right now, there's so much material out there just waiting to be captured and put down. Uh, so I'm, I'm moving in the direction of starting to finish up my projects. I have a lot of open-ended projects ideas and concepts that I've never really finished. So I'm going to start finalizing them, you know, finalizing the lyrics and so forth where they can be repetitively played the same way each time, you know, and embellished as I feel. Interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit more extensively about um, your musical experience. I, I know you 
you said that your father told you that if you were going to play that thing, you would need to go to the park. And that's, yeah. that's not really the kind of encouragement that uh, young musicians need. They, they, they really need someone like, uh, I don't know if you remember that movie, uh, that Denzel Washington did. It was a Spike Lee film, um, in which he, he was a, a trumpet player. Um, okay. I think, I think I do. I don't know if I really seen the whole thing, but I do remember that. I think that was sort of like, uh, it was, he was, he was, uh, oh, what was the name of that trumpet player? It was, he was, he was doing the life of a famous trumpet player. Yeah. I don't think it was Miles Davis though. No, it wasn't Miles Davis. I know that. I'm trying to think of of the trumpet player, but yes, I do. I, I do. Here's the way it went down. When I when I finally got in a band uh, in in junior high and high school, I wanted to play clarinet, and uh, all the clarinets were gone. So. The band leader, the band teacher, trying to build his orchestra, he sent me home with a bassoon. Mm. No. Yeah, it was a bassoon. And that was a double reed instrument. Big, long, wooden tube, you know, with finger holes, like clarinet stuff, you know, all over it. Had a real, real, it's a good, beautiful sounding instrument. But at the time, the reeds cost three dollars and fifty cents a piece, and uh, they didn't last long. And so when I went to my dad and said, "Hey, I need a new reed," he said, "Son, you better take that thing back if you want to play music. You better take that thing back and get something that I only have to buy you one of, and it's on you from from after that." Another dream killed, <laughs> Michael. This is oh man, it's too much. Oh, hey, we, I, I we, went. We, we got to take a break. We got to take a break. So hold that thought, and we're going to come back. You're listening to okay. Open Door on ninety five point nine FM WOVU. I'm Vince Robinson with Michael Honeycomb Hennigan. We'll be right back. What's up, Cleveland? It's your girl, Jazzy J, and I just want to know, have you downloaded our app yet? Yes, our app for Androids and iPhones. All you got to do is go to your app store and download WOVU 95.9 FM, and you can listen to us anywhere. We're back with Michael Honeycomb Hennigan. He is a musician, and I've just learned that he has this extensive history with electronics and computers and, and all that good stuff after working for the VA uh, for several years and then retiring. Uh, before we took the break, we were talking about how you went from a uh, bassoon, uh, you wanted to play clarinet, your music teacher told you, you know, that you would need to take this bassoon home, and then there were reeds that cost three fifty, and your father wasn't willing to pay for them, so you ended up doing what? Well, I went from that to a B-flat cornet. That's when, what I told you before, when uh, my father when my father said, if you want to play this instrument, you're going to do it in the park. Because you, you can just imagine how starting up, trying to play a brass instrument, trying to get your armature and your pitches right and so forth, and trumpets that flugelhorns and uh, cornets weren't the quietest of instruments. So uh, that's when my dad told me, you know, to take it to the park. After I graduated from high school and went into the Navy, I went to the special units, and I was in the drum and bugle corps in boot camp playing a, 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 a B-flat bugle. Uh, that was until they decided that they wanted me to go into the submarine force because I wrote this phenomenal score on my uh, advanced electronics test. And uh, I kind of like shocked all the white people, you know, because uh, 
Black people didn't write scores like that in electronics, you know. So when I got to boot camp, they made me take the test over again, and I wrote a better score. So they were all, all over me about submarine this, submarine that, extra extra money, hazardous duty pay, you know. So I went at. At the time, I was kind of soft between the ears, you know. You know how we are when we're young and dumb. And uh, I ended up in, uh, after I came out of boot camp, I ended up in Dam Neck, Virginia. Never knew there were swamps in Virginia till I got to Dam Neck. It was the Navy's Polaris Guided Missile School. So I'm busting my little chops in there, trying to uh, do the best I could do, keeping my little hard C, you know, uh, going, you know, pass, you know, studying my ass off, passing my classes and so forth. But then I hear the white boys talking about blue and gold crews, and still young and dumb, didn't know what I was into, what I was being set up for. So I asked them to explain that to me. He said, oh, yeah, when you get on submarines, uh, when you go out, you go out and you submerge and you stay underwater from four to six months, and then you come back, and then you on shore leave for four to six months. And I said, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, hold it. You mean bypass this and get rated as a Polaris guided missile technician. I'm going to be on one of them tubes uh, for, four, for four months, six months. Now, I ain't going to see no sunshine because all I knew about submarines was run silent, run deep. Go on the water, shoot a torpedo, and come back up on top. It wasn't like that no more with the nuclear subs and stuff. So I went to the guidance counselor. I said, hey, look, I don't want to be a Polaris technician anymore. I I, I, I want to get out of this school. He said, no, you're too qualified. The only way you can get out of this school is you'd have to flunk out. So that's what I did. I flunked out. They sent me to Newport, Rhode Island, to the USS Yosemite AD-19, and I ended up being a bosun's mate. That was pretty cocky for a minute. Did a med cruise, got over there on to, to into Italy, the Naples Harbor, and they sent me mess cooking. So instead of working on the decks and so forth, I'm in the kitchen now 12 hours a day on port and starboard liberty, port and starboard duty. I said, no, nah, this ain't going to work. I can't be, I can't be no cook. So I took out the electronic technician's uh, course for electronic third and second class. I passed it on the first increment. I, I, I shocked the whole boat. But long story short, you know, it's it, it's been a rough ride. When I got back to when I came back to Cleveland, got hired by the VA, even though I was uh, certified. Senior level technician with mass with math uh, with NASA certification credentials and so forth. They hired me as an entry level tech. Hired me under all the white boys and stuff like that. The other people, I said I wasn't going to use any colors in this, but uh, so I had to fight my way through that that mess. Even still in Cleveland after I came back. It was still alive and well. But when they needed somebody to train somebody, they sent it to me. When they needed something fixed, they sent me. When they needed something installed or set up or special programs, I was the one that did it. But, uh, it, 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 it was a very interesting experience because the, 
good old boy stuff went from in your face to behind the closed doors, and like they say in the boardroom. They smile and skin and grin, you know, and stab you in your back as soon as your back was turned. And then we had some of the, the house Negroes in the department, you know, and they were always trying to get up because they couldn't outperform me as far as the job was concerned. So they would be a bigger suck up than I was because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't brown nose. I tell anybody in a heartbeat, my nose is this color naturally and not from sticking it up somebody's behind. But uh, I retired early because it, it was just, it was just getting to be bad at the VA. And now when I go up there because I'm a veteran. I see some of the people that are still there from my department that haven't retired yet. And I see a wealth of people that haven't retired yet. I could be walking down the hall and and talking to somebody and they'll come out of their office. I knew that voice, you know, and and you know, they remember me that well. I did a lot of entertaining for the VA and, uh, I would always volunteer for different programs and so forth. When the VA was involved with the Veterans Salute uh, in August with Mount Zion Church, I ran the stage. I provided the backline, you know, a band with backline and all the sound equipment. I did that for 11, 12 years. And uh, I still have people saying, you know, they miss when I was there doing those programs and those shows and so forth. So I've kind of earned a little name. Everybody knows me, East Side, West Side. And uh, from that the Cleveland Blues Society had a very uh, special young lady that I call my big sister, uh, uh, Fran Butterscotch. Uh, she called herself Miss Butterscotch, and she was on the board at the at the uh, Cleveland Blues Society. But she had to leave. She had to get off of the board for health reasons, and she put my name in the basket and said, I want you to take my spot on the board. So I was on the board for two years, and then I became the vice president of the Cleveland Blues Society. I did my term, but I eventually stepped back from that because they didn't want to be inclusive. It was too much of a good old boys club and they didn't want to bring any black clubs. Right now there's only one black club. Uh, That's Kirk's Getaway. uh, That's active with the Cleveland Blues Society. I tried to bring in some of the other black clubs, but I got every those people excuse that you could think of, oh, I, I, I wouldn't feel safe, but it was okay for me to go out in Parma and Middleburg Heights and all the other places that they was having Blue Society functions, you know, but they couldn't come into our neighborhood and they had this preconceived, you know, that, 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 that stigma that they've been pushing on us about, you know, oh, we're not safe to be around. And so coming to Wolf's Den was completely out of the question. Uh, there was one the, uh, president before I became vice president was a young lady. She would hang. Uh, she would come to uh, 
uh, the place where Guitar Slum used to play all the time. I'm trying to think of the name of the club or whatever. The Cascade. She would hang out, you know, come see Guitar Slim. She would come up to the Wolf Den. But after she left office and the other, and the next um, board came in and the next president came in, all that changed. Okay. We're going to talk about the blues when we come back because I know you to be the, the, the consummate blues player and, and I can see that it's been a consistent theme in your life because you've always been confronted by these things that would give you the blues. We're going to jump into that when we get back. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM, WOVU, a Burden Bell Car Community Radio Station. Back in a minute. <laughs> Hi, this is Ken Hawkins. Hi, this is Pinky. This is T.C. Lewis. This is Shantae Chappers. This is Reggie Heyman. This is Bill Silverby Richards. If you're not listening to WOVU 95.9 FM, you're not in the mix, 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 mix. I'm Silverby Crank it up. 24 hours of golden. We're back. Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest this morning is Michael Honeycomb Hennigan, and he's just described a scenario where you had this organization that was dedicated to the blues, but they really seemed to only want to experience the blues on the west side and not too much on the east side. Um, What was it about the blues that resonated with you as a musician? I, I don't know. Uh, when I first picked up the harmonica, this was back in Cleveland, uh, I'd be in one of the clubs where we was booty shaking and, you know, getting our disco on and stuff like that. And stuff just didn't, just that wasn't clicking with me. I'd be over in the corner pulling out my little harmonica no one ever really showed me how to play a harmonica. It just seemed like a natural extension. And I'd be over there playing, you know, my beginning steps into the blues. And I guess it was just that black experience, that uh, ancestry coming up through you know, you, you know your DNA is nothing but memories of all your ancestors passed down to you. Uh, whoever was in your family tree, you know. And unfortunately, as you can tell by my complexion, that somewhere in my in my family, someone poured some cream in the coffee. Well, Hennigan says it all, brother. <laughs> Yeah, well, see, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out because sometimes when when we left the plantation, we would take if someone was treating you right and so forth, we would take their name, their last name, instead of carrying on the name that you had when you was on the plantation. And then a lot of them, a lot of, a lot of us kept that plantation name. But somewhere, somehow, because I did a search on the Hennigan. That name is alive and well in Ireland. The exact same spelling. I found there's a guy in Columbus, and he is not on my branch of the tree, but his last name is Hennigan. In fact, his first name is Michael. Mm. I even reached out to him. You know, I called up with him on Facebook, you know. And, uh, you know, so that's always been a curiosity. I was talking to uh, uh, one of my cousins, my past cousin, he's deceased now, his wife. And uh, she needed to vent, you know, because she was feeling kind of low. So we had a conversation, and I expressed to her that I'm getting ready to do one of those uh, ancestry uh, 
tree searches, you know, not the uh, DNA search, but the tree search, you know, to try to figure out where I got this name from because I know just enough about my family on my father's side to know where he came from and who his father was, which, which is a man I never met because he passed before his family came to Cleveland. But uh, I, I still have no idea how. I know more about my mother's side of the fat family, who her maiden name was Washington. And I know that uh, one of my great, 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 great uncles stayed in the same carriage house that George Washington stayed in when he was mapping uh, White Post, Virginia. And I know my mother's side of the family was the holdings of one of the cousins of one of the presidents. So I, I got, I, I got, I, my blood is tainted. <laughs> but the downside to that is I got their tablets in my DNA. So I have these things that pop into my head. You know, like people say deja vu or something. And I just, no, I, I didn't seen this or I didn't experienced this before. Something ain't right here. And uh, like they say, you, you, you can smell a skunk long before you see him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've had this, this journey through where, like James Brown say, Papa don't take no mess. You know, I've always been that kind of way. You know, I ain't kissing nobody's butt, and uh, you only gonna talk to me a certain kind of way. And uh, even though, even when I was in the military, you know, just because you got that stripe on your arm doesn't mean. You can just act stupid and, you know, just tell me to do anything and everything just because you you got you think you got the power. This ain't Castle Gray Skull. You know. You know, that stuff just didn't work with me. But uh coming back in Cleveland, you know when I left Cleveland, the whole thing with Cleveland, especially on our side of the fence, was envy, jealousy, and greed. You know, they would talk about you if you had a little something, no matter that you worked hard and earned it the right way, they would talk about you because they were jealous of the fact that you had and they didn't because they didn't want to go out and get it, you know. By the time I come back uh, from the Navy and uh, from California, this welfare mentality was so ingrained in our people that all they want to do is somebody to give them something. You can see it a lot in the females. You can see it a lot. And what, what really gets me is these young kids they would rather come up and beg and ask you to give them something rather than going out to work for it. When I came up, we hustled. I've been a hustler my whole life. I hustled coat hangers because at that time, places like Checker Cleaners, I don't know if you remember them, and some of the other cleaner uh, chains that we here would buy coat hangers back from you for two cents a piece. I would get bottles, two and five cents a piece. Uh, I cut grass. I shoveled snow. I washed windows. I raked leaves. You know, we hustled. I pulled groceries home from the supermarket on my little red wagon. But I'm just reflecting on that because my driveway was is, is snowed in, you know. I finally had to bust out of the driveway because when the snow plow came down, you know they put that three-foot wall 
right. of crust and hard and, and hard snow. And most of the time, with the temperature going up and down, it's in turn to ice. Right. So, but so yeah. Once, think, once upon a time, once upon a time, folks would knock on your door and ask if you would like for them to shovel your sidewalks and your driveway. That doesn't happen a whole lot anymore. That don't happen now. Cause I ain't seen that near kid out there. I was willing to pay good money, and I've even heard a couple friends of my own Facebook say the same thing. I was willing to pay good would pay good money to get somebody to you know do my driveway and stuff. Yeah, I ain't seen nobody. I even called this guy and went to ask one of the guys whose family I grew up with. There's still a few of us left on the street from from back in the day and I talked to one of the grandkids and he gave me this guy's number and ain't got no business sense ain't got no bit you know instead of calling me and saying hey look I had to put my truck in the shop you know I'm supposed to get it back and so in a couple hours or something so you know anything business like to, you know to keep the deal because I was gonna pay him 50 bucks to pull out my driveway out. Yes, yes he missed out. And, uh, so we just have a, we just have a couple minutes left. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just don't want to d- deny you the opportunity to talk about what you're working on now, what you have in the works. Well, I'm with a new group. Uh, the, the band's name is Rare Creed. Uh, we, we have, the reason why I'm sticking with these folks right now it's because we rehearse. And there's an opportunity to do uh, original music. You know, right now we're working on getting a show together with, uh, you know, standards and stuff like that. Even though I have never really been r and I'm I'm going against, you know, my thing, and I'm learning some R&B, you know. Some of the standards, the old baby, baby stuff, you know, mm-hmm. the baby making music. But uh, I get to do some blues, too, and uh, it's in an environment where I can, you know, try to start creating some of my new, uh, some of my new ideas. I went and bought me uh, a couple of little synthesizers. Because I've always been, like I say, I, I never call myself a musician. I always like the term sophisticated noisemaker. Okay. And I get to make some sophisticated noise out of these things. Boy, it is fun. And uh, I'm setting up this little bootleg or... I ain't got no money studio type thing, you know, uh, to try to capture some of my ideas and to work on my uh, on some of my creative, get my creative juices going. Okay. Well, when when you get all these things pulled together, know that there is a stage on the east side of Cleveland that is waiting for you and your gang to do performances. I can offer that to you, and perhaps it will be something that serves a your audience well. Uh, Michael Honeycomb Hennigan, it has been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation with you. Uh, if you are, do you want folks to, to seek you out? If you, if you do, uh, let them know how they can reach you. Well, I have a Facebook page. If you type in Facebook under the search bar, Michael Honeycomb Hennigan, you will find me. Okay. I have another page that's just Michael Hennigan. I don't really use it that much. Uh, I prefer, because I, I basically use Facebook to communicate primarily for music, but I have gotten to some philosophical and political discussions okay. uh, on Facebook, but uh, basically I use it basically for music. Okay. We're going to have to leave it right there. Look out for him on uh, Facebook and put in Michael Honeycomb Hennigan. He'll take you to the right page. Thanks for joining us this morning, my brother. No, thank you for allowing me 
the chance to vent. <laughs> okay. Well, we need to hear what you have to say, and we will continue to listen. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. Make today your best day, Cleveland.